Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's back yet again. My bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. It's the story that never ends. I apologize if he just got that song stuck in anyone's head. And for a quick fix, pink fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows. It helps a lot. Today's stories are Haymaking Time by Rosemary Garland and Billy's Birthday Adventure by Margaret Connor. Haymaking Time. Uncle Jeremy's combine harvester went round and round the hayfield. Philip stood high on the bank and watched it gobble up the long grass, magically parcel it, and then toss it like huge hay bricks behind it. Uncle Jeremy had started cutting from the outside edge of the field, and then he drove the machine round and round in smaller and smaller circles toward the middle. Philip wondered what would happen when the combine harvester reached the very middle. But the field was very big, and Uncle Jeremy didn't finish it before lunch. At last, Uncle Jeremy stopped the machine, jumped down, and walked across to Philip. Let's have our sandwiches, he shouted. Philip ran to where the two sacks of sandwiches lay in the shade under the tree. Philip had a little sack all to himself. He felt like a grown-up farmer as he took out his sandwiches and flask of cool drink. After lunch, said Uncle Jeremy, I will finish cutting this field and you will see lots of rabbits running out as the patch of grass in the middle gets smaller and smaller. Will you count them for me? Yes, said Philip. Uncle Jeremy finished his sandwiches and lay back on the grass with his hat over his eyes and went to sleep. But he soon jumped up and said, Back to work! Philip watched impatiently for the first rabbit to run out of the grass. There it went, helter-skelter across the field and into the hedgerow. Then another, and another. Soon there were more rabbits than Philip could count. One came darting out and went zigzagging across the field, leaping as it went. It had very long ears and was much bigger than the other rabbits. Uncle Jeremy had seen it too. He stopped the engine and told Philip that it was a hare, not a rabbit. Philip wondered how Uncle Jeremy would cut the very last piece of grass. It stood up like a tuft of newly washed hair. But Uncle Jeremy stopped the machine again and came across to Philip. Would you like to pretend to be a rabbit and hide in that tiny island of grass just before I cut it? Oh, yes, said Philip. He ran across and started to crawl into the island of grass. But suddenly, he stopped. There, just in front of him, was a tiny baby rabbit, crouched down and far too frightened to race out across the open field. May I keep him for a pet? He asked Uncle Jeremy. Well, no, said Uncle Jeremy. That would be unkind. You see how frightened he is already. And that's a leveret, too. That's a baby hare. Look at its extra long back legs for leaping with. He would be so unhappy in a rabbit hutch. Philip was disappointed, but he took the leveret to the hedge and placed him gently in the long grass. The leveret did not move. He went on crouching until Philip went away. At last the field was finished. The last tuft of grass had been cut, and they were ready for home. Philip took one quick look in the hedge. The leveret had gone. You are a very kind boy, said Uncle Jeremy. That little leveret will always remember you for letting him live a lovely wild life with all his friends. This story, just poor rabbits and hares. I mean, really being scared out of a field like that. But, but that big thing. Also, would you like to run into this tuft of grass so you can pretend to be a rabbit while I drive towards it, my big machine? No, before I cut it. Well, he does say just before I cut it. So it sounds like he's implying that the kid should stand in there while I'm going to drive this big machine towards it and at the last minute jump out of the way. I don't think that was the intention. I know, but it's like the way it's phrased, it feels like that to me. Yeah, but I thought that they were trying to have Philip go in to startle any other rabbits that might still be in there. I think that's what they were thinking. Is this what the farmer was thinking? Like, go in there and make sure there's no other rabbits in there. But would you like to pretend? I'm like, what? Also, the art's very nicely done. The perspective's a little odd on this bigger shot on the left-hand page. Mostly with the way the hay bales are. 
And the tractor, I think, is like not quite the right perspective for the shot they have, but it is a nicely rendered tractor. Hand drawn, too, on some parts. It's hand drawn overall, but I'm saying like they didn't use a ruler or anything for some parts, like these lines right here. But the lines down here looks like they did use some straight edge tools. And since Lux is pointing at a picture and nobody is seeing that, he's talking about the combine machine and some lines that are on the rectangle that's behind the farmer as being done freehand and the lines of the cutter at the front of the unit having some elements that look like there's some straight edge work. I, I like the little bunnies and hairs they have. Those are very well done too. I like the way they're using color to emphasize the shape of the hay at less of outlines and less of using outlines for everything. And they left that for the animals so you can see them distinctly from the background. Very nice use of color. Billy's birthday adventure. Billy was in bed with a cold. On his birthday, too. It was a shame. He'd been looking forward to his special birthday drive in the car with Mother and the birthday tea afterwards. Never mind, said Mother. We can have the birthday tea up here in the bedroom, and we can have a pretend birthday drive. Mother hurried to get all her jobs in the house finished quickly. Now, she said when at last she was ready, where shall we go? I'll ask my birthday panda, said Billy. Panda says he'd like to go and see some more pandas, said Billy after he whispered in the panda's ear. All right, we'll pretend to go to the zoo, said Mother. Oh no, he says he wants to go where the real pandas live, said Billy. Goodness, that would be China, said Mother. It's a long way. We couldn't go by car. We'll go on my toy airplane, said Billy. All right then. Close your eyes and let's start pretending now, said Mother. Billy closed his eyes. We're off, he said. We're flying very high. Now we're looking down through the clouds and I can see China. I can see some trees. I think it's a big forest, said Mother. Panda says it's where his family lives. We'd better land now, said Billy. Bring the plane down carefully, said Mother. We have to land on the side of this big mountain, and it's all covered with snow. We're down, cried Billy. Out you get, Panda. Oh dear, he added. Panda's run away. I wonder where he's gone, said Mother. I can't see anything but snow around here, except that bit of black tree stump over there. Well, I never. Would you believe it, she laughed. It's not a tree stump at all. It's Panda. He's just turned round and looked at me. I really thought he was a tree stump in the snow. I expect that's why he's colored black and white, said Billy, so that he can't be seen in the snow. Then he'd be safe from people who came to hunt him, because they would think he was just a piece of old tree and pass by. Yes, how clever of you, Billy. I'm sure you're right, said Mother. Well, shall we go across to the forest now? I will walk in front with Panda. And if he sees anyone we don't like, he can frighten them away for us, said Billy. Good, said Mother. I'll follow close behind. Can you see anything exciting yet? Ooh, yes, I can see lots of pandas, cried Billy. I think they're having their tea. They would be eating bamboo shoots then, said Mother. That's what pandas eat in their own country. There'd be nothing else for them in this forest. I don't want bamboo shoots for my birthday tea, said Billy. I think we'll go home and have my birthday cake now. It was lucky they decided to do this, because just then Daddy came home. We've been to China for my birthday, said Billy. Did you take Bamboo Eater with you? asked Daddy, picking up Panda. Why did you call him that? asked Billy. Because that's his name. Panda means Bamboo Eater, explained Daddy. When Billy was better, he went to the zoo to see the real Panda. Hello, Bamboo Eater, he cried. That's what panda really means, he told the surprise keeper. Cute. Ooh, didn't notice that goggles before. Because the page was slightly curved for me, so all I saw was the mother on the back of the plane. Nice goggles. Very cute. Also, that smile is kind of creepy to me. Is that just me? No, no, it kind of reminds me of the one from the Daniel and the Magic Frog. Also, I love how they have this nice big shot of him at the zoo, but that doesn't come until the very end of the story. Yeah, well, it's kind of a bit of misdirection because they were going to pretend to go to the zoo. The two color artists did a really good job here again with, like, there are no outlines. Everything is just swatches of color that make up the shapes with texture. 
I got sponge texture again and more stenciling, especially with the mountains down here on this one image where the mother and son are flying in their airplane. Ooh, all very nice. And there's the birthday cake at the very bottom there. That is rendered very nicely as well. Both the stuffed animal and the one at the zoo. So what were your thoughts on this crazy adventure? It was cute. It's another, both of these actually are ones I don't really remember rereading a lot. Even though they both technically have animals in them, they're more about the little boys than they are about the animals. Oh, I just noticed he has a couple of birthday cards on his bedside table there. I wonder if it's supposed to be like something healthy like apple juice or something on that bottle. I'm betting it's supposed to be some kind of juice because it, the bottle looks like it has a label on it, so it's not just water. And it's really too large to be a bottle of medicine. And there's a glass with a similar looking liquid next to it. So that could just be the two color palette. Now how do you show a clear liquid in a state like this? You make it a little bit opaque. But if it was just water, I wouldn't expect what looks like a label on the bottle. Remember the publication date. Mm. I was mostly referring to the glass. I think it's a very nice, cute story. It didn't feel as awkward as the other one did to me. No. The other one was a little awkward. This was just cute. This was kind of like Elizabeth's magic rocking horse. It's a good way to have kids use their imaginations. Like, if you can't go somewhere when you have to stay in bed and you don't have video games to entertain you, use your head. I did that all the time. This is why I have way too many stories going in my head all the time. I would drive anyone crazy. Yes. <laughs> Shall we move on to the poem? I am a little penguin, and would you like to know that I live at the South Pole, and it is white with snow. And though I have a pair of wings, and though I really try, when I jump into the air, I cannot really fly. But you should see them swim. It's like they're flying. Yeah, through the water. I mean, realistically, if you think about it, Birds flap their wings and they move through air, which is like water, except it's less dense. Water is more dense, so they develop fins so they could fly through the water. So their wings still allow them to fly. Just not in the traditional sense. All right, so this has been another installment of My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories were Haymaking Time by Rosemary Garland and Billy's Birthday Adventure by Margaret Connor. Okay, I just flipped ahead. It looks like we're getting down to the last dozen or so stories. Wow, we've been at this a while. Uh-huh. Holy smokes. This is probably the longest running continuing air quote series in Ember's Reading Room. And they are not at all connected. Oh, so it's a bunch of wonderful little stories. Nice little vignettes. So if you haven't listened to the other ones yet, you can go back and do that. Or you can re-listen to them. And now that we're getting close to the end, see if you can do some amazing connectivity, degree of separation type graph. And explain how all of these actually happen in the same universe. Good homework for our viewers slash listeners. I could see somebody taking that on, but I'm like, I don't know. And they probably can't start it yet because they don't have all the information because we're not done with the book. I always want to say, today on Game Theory. <laughs> or, you know, if you haven't picked up a copy of this book yet and would like to, you could order it for really cheap on Amazon. And then you could read ahead, read along, read behind. Read around, is that even a thing? Well, you could take the book to different locations. So yes, read around would be a thing. Read upside down. And I'm not just talking about the book being upside down. I'm talking about you yourself. And if you just feel like shopping, hey, we've got the Ebates link too, because hey, shopping, why not try to save a little money? Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. Thank you again for listening. Sincerely.